start recording. I guess this is day one of week 13. This The college is counting this is week 13, not week one. So uh, good news, that means the midterm is this Thursday, not next Thursday. Actually, it wouldn't matter either way. So uh, your next uh, midterm is coming up. So let's go over uh, the one topic that we needed to uh, finish up and uh, let's do that. Let's see how do we how do we do this? What is on top? Okay. All right. So Maria, do you see the PowerPoint presentation and the uh, yeah in my face and everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yesterday, uh, while I was uploading my video for CSI forty one, uh, Garner's came to fix a broken pipe. Uh, a tree root had broken one of my irrigation lines, and to dig next to it, they cut right through my internet line. So I am currently broadcasting using my cell phone. So apologies for any of uh, recording quality issues, and um, we'll do our best. So I'm, uh, so Malia, I'm gonna like rather than me having to go back and forth between Discord because I only got my dorky little laptop screen here. Um, if anybody asks a good question, will you just pipe up and uh, and shout it at me? Okay. So you're making me a Discord mod. Is that what this is? Uh, you're you're like a text to speech bot. I see. I see. <laughs> All right. You're you're yeah you're a Discord bot. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Oh, what's happening? Is your camera on a drone? All right. There we go. So uh, no, it's I, I have a sit stand desk, so I'll stand up for this. Ah. All right, here we go. CSI forty five memory management. All right, so no grip projects. Shame, shame, shame. Hi everyone. Hello. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to read those. Just if somebody has a question. <laughs> yeah. So we talked last time about interrupts. So like basically any time you do a SWI zero or somebody clicks the mouse or hits a key, an interrupt is sent to the operating system. And the uh, the operating system has something called an interrupt a handler, a, a jump table. And it looks at what kind of interrupt it was and then launches a small program that will handle the interrupt. For example, if you move the mouse thousand, a thousand times a second, it will interrupt. And the mouse will report, I moved up five pixels or whatever. And the OS will see, oh, interrupt number 50 occurred. And it calls the program for the mouse handler. And the mouse handler simply says, okay, um, the mouse was at 400, 400 before, and it moved up 50. So it's now uh, 350, 400, right? And it just kind of tracks where the, where the mouse is. And um, probably the display driver or something like that will draw the mouse at the right location uh, when when it comes time to update the, the screen. Okay, And if you uh, look at proc interrupts on Linux, you can uh, see what uh, what interrupts are set up on your system. So uh, back in the MS-DOS days, uh, you would actually have to assign interrupts to devices. This is why Macintoshes exist. <laughs> because it would do it for you, basically. Like on a Mac, you never needed to set the IRQ of your keyboard or anything like that. But on MS-DOS, you would literally say, okay, my mouse is interrupt line five. And if you installed a new ethernet card or something and it, it used interrupt line five, then your mouse would stop working. And so you could have incompatibilities between your sound card and your ethernet card and your keyboard or whatever. And it was just this super garbage system. And that really didn't go away until mid nineties, probably. So for probably about 15 years, it was just complete garbage on PCs and Macs. You just plug and play, you plug a mouse in, it works, put a keyboard in, it works. They never had that problem. Um, windows nowadays, you know, you've probably never had an interrupt conflict. Um, so, uh, what happens if you have multiple interrupts is that if you have a higher priority interrupt and a lower prior priority interrupt going on at the same time, like maybe the lower priority interrupt 
is operating and it's like updating the mouse or something like that, then a higher priority one comes in, it pauses the old one and it runs the new one. And so two interrupts can happen at the same time and there's a priority system that will choose which one takes priority. Okay. So when you segfault your, your program, that will actually send a signal, an interrupt, um, and you can either handle it yourself, like we talked last time, there is a um, there is a system call called signal, and that will set up a, a callback, a function that will happen. Um, there's another alternative to it as well, but don't worry about it. Um, uh, and you can either use the default signal handler, which will kill your program. You can set it to sig ignore, which will ignore the seg fault, which is probably a bad idea. Yeah, or you can handle it yourself and write a program to handle it. So write a function to handle it. Um, so um, by default, though, the default segfault function will actually, uh, if you have core dumps turned on, it won't just kill your program. It'll actually save your program to disk. And it'll save the state of RAM and the state of the program and all that stuff. It saves it all to disk. So you can do an autopsy on it so that you can do the GDB 8.0 core, right? GDB space 8.0 space core. You do that and it, and GDB will launch 8.0 and it will read from the core file. And it'll put everything in RAM where it was before. It'll put the state of the registers, everything in the core file. Uh, holds the state of the program at the moment of death. And then you can examine it. You can go up the call stack. I see this function called this function called this function. So you can go up three levels and print out the variables there and, and see exactly what was going on when your program died, which is really, really useful. Um, in recent years, there's there's been an even cooler advancement in uh, debuggers, which is you, you kind of um, have time traveling ability. And so uh, there's... Uh, there's debuggers these days you can actually rewind time and, and not just like view the program at the moment of death but also go backwards in time and see what led up to it like did somebody double click too fast you know um because i was crashing my code uh the uh the colors.h thing if i if i double click it would actually crash it uh because apparently a different uh a different uh escape sequence is sent in PuTTY, if you double click, then if you click. And my code wasn't handling it. And so it's really useful to be able to go backwards in time and figure out, okay, what the hell just happened? You know, that's, uh, I don't know if GDB does that, but um, there, there's definitely uh, time traveling debuggers um, on Windows that do that, and it's really cool. Okay, so so the, the question is like, all right, Let's, let's say you try accessing memory zero. What actually causes the seg fault? Who's actually keeping track of where your boundaries are? You know, who keeps track of, this is your code segment. You can run code from there, but you can't write it. Who's keeping track of your data segment, your BSS, your stack. And that's, that's a device called the MMU, the memory management unit. It's different from MMA. MMA is uh, cage fighting. MMU is cage fighting. <laughs> Basically, you've got a boundary, and if you go outside of the boundary, fault. You know? So, um, it's like a fault in tennis, right? If you step over the line in tennis when you're serving, right? Fault. And that's literally what the MMU does. The MMU will be like, you went outside of the bounds. Fault. And it will send a seg fault. So every time you try accessing a location in memory, it passes transparently through the MMU. And the MMU has your memory map in it. Starting, ending. Okay. It's within. It's okay. And so literally the MMU is bounds checking everything you're doing. It's bounds checking everything you're doing. Now it doesn't bounds check your arrays, which would be really useful, right? Like it'd be really nice if... Um, every array that you had in C was somehow like, it would be really cool if you could tell the MMU, here's my array. If I go outside of that array, you know, but uh, it, it doesn't, um, uh, it just is like, here's your stack, here's your data. And as long as you're within those boundaries, it'll allow it. It doesn't actually, it doesn't bounce check arrays for you. 
Although that would be pretty sweet. Okay, so um, the uh, the really important thing, the, the big concept here is the is the concept of virtual memory. So virtual memory is the notion that um, you actually don't know what RAM access you're at. This whole time um, we've been working on it, the um, I've been having you guys print out pointers and things like that and telling you this is the memory address. No, it's not. You actually have no way of knowing what memory address uh, any of your stuff's at because it, it lies to you. Okay, And so uh, whenever you print out a pointer, you get some memory address. That is your virtual memory address. So if, you, if, I, if I print out, uh, if I have a pointer to memory address 5000, and I print out the variable at address 5,000, it prints out 42, X is 42, X is memory address 5,000. It's all, uh, it's not actually at memory address 5,000. It's probably at memory address somewhere 32 gigabytes later, you know, um, and there's no way of telling that because uh, every program thinks that it owns the entire address space. Every program thinks it starts at zero and it goes up to seven F, 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 okay. Every program thinks it has complete access to the entire RAM, okay? And it doesn't. So what happens is that when you run a program, like if you run a program multiple times, think about it. There's two different Xs, right? You, you run a program, you run it again. Nothing stops you from doing that. And if X is always at memory address 5,000, then the two programs would be reading and writing to the exact same spot in RAM, right? And that would be weird. You know, every time you run, um, you know, the program, it's sharing memory with all the other invocations of it. It'd be very weird. You can only have one Vim, you know. Um, so uh, what happens is when, when your program launches, it creates a virtual memory segment. So it says, okay, this program thinks, it's like the matrix, right? It creates the matrix for your program and it. Here's the zero, here's the top of memory, seven FFFFF, and go. And then that actually gets placed somewhere in RAM. And you might think like, wait, how do you place the entire contents of RAM into RAM? And, and the reality is you don't actually have all that, all that memory. Like if you've got a hundred megabytes of stack space, um, it's, it's just a hundred megabytes of stack space and we'll just find a, a chunk of, of RAM and, and put it there. And your data segment doesn't have to be below it. Your data segment could be to the right of the stack in an actual RAM. You don't know. All those different segments could be placed uh, in physical RAM wherever the operating system wants it to be placed. But whenever you access something, if you access memory address zero, then it consults the memory map, the, the virtual memory manager, translates, okay, I'm trying to access memory address 5000, and then it goes through a translation process and finds the actual place in RAM where it exists. Okay. So you have virtual memory, which is all that you ever have experienced. All you've known is the matrix. And then there's actually physical memory, which is where actually in RAM uh, variables are. And you basically have no way of getting out of that. Okay. So like if you thought your program starts at zero, uh, it might actually be starting at, uh, what is that? Three, 10 million, right? You don't know. All right. And so when your program says load for memory address F, then the MMU will take the, you know, remember how we've been talking about base plus offset. It'll take the base 10 million and add the offset F to it. And if that's legal to read from, because remember every chunk of RAM, you can have read access, write access, and execute access. If you could read from it, cool. If not, seg fault. And if you can read from it, then it goes base plus offset and it reads from physical address 10 million and F. It's actually pretty fast. Um, it's actually pretty fast. And so it can, it can translate pretty quickly. Most of the time it is transparent. However, it, it's not always. So, um, any questions so far, by the way? None.
Yeah, okay. Here's, here's a good illustration of it. So you've got your code segment, your BSS, your data, your stack, and um, how it actually maps to, to RAM. It, it, it doesn't have to be contiguous. In fact, it's probably not. Because this is, again, your program thinks it has all of RAM, and it, and it doesn't. So your stack might be here. Your code segment might be page to disk. Probably not page to disk. But, and then other processes can be interleaved within it. <clears throat> now this map here, um, the... Uh, it's got a PowerPoint presentation involving somebody else's PowerPoint presentation. Fantastic. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So basically, you try accessing a virtual address, and then the um, uh, your memory manager actually has a cache. It's got a um, what's called a translation look aside buffer, and I guess that works. High quality graphics, rather. Right. So program one, it'll the different segments will get mapped to different chunks of RAM. And how that mapping takes place is held in a cache. And it's held in a cache called a translation look aside buffer. This thing again, your head hurts. Why does your head hurt, Blavi? What did you call that thing? It is called a translation look aside buffer yep. and so the translation look aside buffer is a cache and so we've talked a lot about caching in this class uh, it's a cache that keeps track of those translations and basically as long as your program is behaving reasonably like it's you're not going to be um, probably having to worry about it um, basically uh, what it what yeah quoting Wikipedia um, what you have is you've got your um, your different physical addresses, virtual addresses, uh, and it maps between them. Okay, and um, and so the uh, uh, in some in some circumstances you can get misses on this and um, you have page faults and things like that. And uh, um, in general, under normal circumstances, it's not something. You Super need to worry about. Really, There's, that's all it is. Okay, so uh, in short, the MMU protects the operating system. So it's it's a security measure, right? It it allows every program to have what they think is full access to uh, RAM, and they don't know that they don't. Yeah. It also keeps you from uh, modifying the kernel, right? And so basically, if you ever try editing the RAM of the kernel, the kernel is all RAM that starts with F. So your program goes from 0 to 7. F, 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 you can think of uh, your program in all the positive RAM addresses, and you can think of the OS in all the negative ones. If you think of it as a signed integer, then any memory address that starts the one, like seven, or not seven, eight, right? Eight to F, <clears throat> all of those are in negative address space. That's where the operating system lives, and you can't access it. The MMU will protect the kernel from unauthorized uh, access. So, or you can think of the OS as above yours. If you're talking about unsigned integers, then eight is above seven, right? Zero, one, one, one. Next one up is eight. So, um, so if you're talking about unsigned integers, the operating system is above you in RAM. If you're talking about signed integers, the operating system is below you in RAM. It kind of doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, the the main the main takeaway point is. Um, uh, it's in a different chunk of memory. Now, here's a really cool thing. You can actually map memory from one program to another. You can map memory from the operating system to your program. So what does that mean? We need to find a tablet right now. Um, we have a tablet. I'll be right back.
Okay, so you guys remember how does it not allow drawing? Any questions so far? I think it would probably be useful to kind of go through the process of like the order of when these different things are invoked and what they do when they get invoked. Yes. Plan on doing that. So like from the start of the program. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, all right. Okay. So from the start of a program. Okay. Um, so here's your Enix prompt. You type a dot out. Okay. So what happens? Inside of the inside of the a dot out thing, um, it's held in something called elf executable loader format, and that basically says where your it, it kind of holds your memory map, right? And so when the when the thing execs your program, exec is the loader, right? The loader reads this thing and it sets up in RAM. I need the drivers installed on this thing. It sets up in RAM your code segment, uh, the minefield of doom, uh, the BSS, which, which is where globals live, the data segment, and the stack. Okay. And so, and then it points at the entry point in code and starts running it. Okay. So uh, wherever start is, and that's held in the that's held in the map as well. So that's that's what happens when you run a program. It the the thing holds a memory map, the the loader loads it, sets everything up, and wherever start is, whatever memory address start is at, it runs it. Now, behind the scenes, if you're actually talking about physical RAM, um, you know your stack. Like that, that's just virtual, right? That yeah, this is all left. this is all virtual memory. This is not real. <laughs> You're given a virtual address space. And so uh, physical memory, your actual RAM is over here. And there's something called the MMU that translates between the two of them. Okay. So when you try accessing, like let's say you, you try finding start. Let's say start is at uh, memory address, uh, I don't know, 1,000. And... Um, yeah, and so what happens is the MMU will say, okay, I'm trying to read from memory address 1000. And so the MMU says, is that allowed? Is that within the bounds? Here's the start of the code segment. Here's the end of the code segment. Yes, it is within the boundary. And then it will translate that into an actual RAM address. Maybe this is RAM address 555999911111, you know, whatever. Um, and then it will fetch whatever data is there and uh, and run it, right? Um, and so anytime you read or write to RAM, the MMU will sit there and translate a virtual memory address into a physical memory address. Right? So it, it will go back and forth between these two things transparently. Like, you don't notice it. Does that make sense, William? Nick? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, and so the MMU has this map kind of cached within the TLB. And it actually has mapping for each individual page. So it's not even, I, I'm, I'm still kind of oversimplifying it here. Uh, a page of memory is usually like a K or something like that. And so you can have a, a page over here and a page over here. Um, but uh, that's that's the general idea, okay? So if you were hear about a page fault, um, like, uh, let's see. How do you... 
So like if I were to say time a dot out, insert five, search for five, four to quit. Um, you see right there, zero page faults. That's that's what it's talking about. So um, one of the uh, if you go into details, let's see where is it performance. Go to resource monitor. Um, this is the kind of stuff that like when you really get into perfing your code and seeing how fast it's running, it's one of the things you keep track of. Um, you, you want to track your, your cache hit rate and here's perf mon right there. Yeah, okay. Um, and so CPU disk network memory, how many faults a second you're getting. All right. And, uh, Hard faults a second, you know, and so we, we track that kind of stuff. You can you can see that at least, like I said, at normal, you know, non non intensive uh, usage, like it, you're probably not going to notice anything. Um, yeah, so a page fault is when you're requesting a memory page. And uh, like I said, that's a chunk of memory. You know, I, I've been talking about it in terms of segments. It's actually held in pages when it's not currently mapped by the MMU into a virtual address space. And so, um, yeah. Um, um, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, um, yeah, so, right. Uh, Yes. So, uh, yeah, sorry. I, okay. So one more step to this. That's really important. Uh, which is probably coming up Hold on here. Nope. Okay. Now I, I really need to talk about it. So one of the, one of the really big things about virtual memory is you can actually have your, um, your memory and hard drive. And so, uh, okay, there we go. So hard drive, hard drive, hard drive, jeez. Hard drive, there you go. So let's say that you run out of RAM, okay? So let's say that you've got all these different programs, you know, Mui has got his program running and it's eating up, um, it's eating up a lot of hard drive space, right? So he's taking up this chunk of RAM and this chunk of RAM. And these are gargantuan chunks of RAM. So what happens when you run out of memory? Well, the memory manager can actually page out pages of, of memory to disk, right? So let's say that I haven't accessed any of my global variables or whatever in a while. So the MMU keeps track of these things. And so in addition to the translation look aside buffer, caching the, the, the thing, uh, it can also remember how often these things are used and it'll be like, you know what? He hasn't really used this chunk of memory over here at all. It's like a hundred megs of memory. So I can, I can do this. And so watch this, uh, eraser and pen. So I'm going to just have his BSS write to disc instead. Okay. So this is called paging out memory. And it's going to go to what's called the swap file. And so his BSS, my BSS was here before, not now. My BSS is now on disk. And so what happens is that if they try accessing this, the MMU will throw a page fault. And the page fault will say, mm -mm, it's on RAM anymore. And it's on hard drive. And so it throws an exception. And the operating system says, all right, bring it back, boys, bring it back. And then it will bring that back into RAM, maybe in the same place, maybe in a different place. It doesn't really matter. Let's draw it in a different place. Let's find a spot here for it. And then it'll keep going. And so the MMU has to keep track of what's on hard drive, what's in RAM, all this kind of stuff. And uh, if you run out of room, then your, your operating system will start paging things to disk. So you've got a swap file on your hard drive. And uh, uh, did I close out of putty? I did, didn't I? Come back in. Uh, 
Means to fill. Um, yeah, so you've got you've got a swap file on your on your Unix machine that is used specifically for, for that purpose. It allows the operating system to move things from RAM into disk. And like I said, you're not going to see a page fault under normal operation because we have plenty of RAM these days. You know, but like I said, if Muya starts really hammering the system and eating up all the hard, uh, eating, eating up all the um, the RAM, and maybe I've got 30 students and they're all benchmarking it and stuff like that, and the system runs out of RAM, then you're going to start getting page faults left and right because the operating system is going to be very hurriedly trying to take things from RAM and move it to hard drive, then take things from hard drive and move it to RAM, and and um, the system slows down dramatically because the hard drive is much, much slower than RAM, you know? So, um, yeah, so Muya has his own virtual memory here. So he thinks he starts at zero and goes up to 7FF. Uh, F, 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 F. Mine starts at zero, goes up to seven. F, 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 F. Um, but like uh, the the memory management unit finds chunks of RAM to use and it moves pages uh, in and out between the hard drive as need be and so on and so forth. It's a very interesting system that just works transparently. Like you haven't needed to know about it until until now, right? So. Uh, Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, do, 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 yeah. And so, um, all right. I was going to talk about mapping next. Right. So that that was an important thing that I didn't actually put into the um, PowerPoint presentation. It's kind of important though. It, it mattered a lot more in the past because in the past you would run out of RAM easily, right? Like my Mac uh, in college when I was doing programming had eight megabytes of RAM, right? And so it's really easy to run out of eight megabytes of RAM, you know, because you got the operating system and, and everyone else I had a 500 megabyte hard drive. And so what happened is let's say I'm, I'm you know, I've got a, a, a four megabyte array, a whopping four megabyte array that's like half my RAM. Um, uh if I'm not using chunks of this RAM, those chunks will get paged out. So even chunks of it will get paged out. And if I'm not using them, then straight to the hard drive, straight to Gulag. Okay. Then if I ever try accessing them again, the MMU throws a page fault. Uh, the, the exception handler, the interrupt handler, uh, grabs the chunk of data off the disk and brings it back in. And in that way, you can have a eight megabyte system act like it has more than eight, eight megs of RAM. Uh, nowadays though, it's considered very, um, um, what's the right word? Uh, we, RAM's cheap, right? And so um, it's, if you're gonna be doing intensive computing and you need more RAM than what you have, buy more RAM, right? <laughs> is, is basically the, the attitude we have today, right? Because Hard drives are so slow that a paging out's not not good. If you have an SSD, you may be like, well, SSDs are fast. Yeah, they're still way slower than RAM, you know. And so if you get to the point where you've exhausted physical RAM and you're having to use your hard drive as RAM, your your program's performance is going to go to hell, right? It will go to hell. And so just buy more RAM <laughs> is usually the answer, you know, don't. Don't rely on virtual memory to save you. Because back in the day, like, like you would new memory, right? You didn't even know, like, if you nude uh, a megabyte, like, you didn't even know if it would succeed. And so it was very common back then to call new and then check to see if you got a null pointer. If you got a null pointer, that means your system is out of RAM. And, um, yeah, like, you probably should still be doing that, by the way, in computer science, like, in, in, in C++. Every time you call new, you should be checking to see if a null pointer comes out. And most of you guys haven't because we have so much RAM, right? Like we actually have, we're, we're very spoiled as far as how much RAM we have. But if you guys ever go to work on like an Arduino or an embedded system and things like that, where you have very constrained RAM, you know, you got 8K of RAM. Uh, yeah, you got it. You got to check for that. You know, you got to, 
you got to pay really close attention to your, your, your RAM usage. So that, that old school system of thought is still around. Okay, so now let's say that um, let's say that Mui and I are actually both playing um, the same game. Okay. So this is Battle Sloop 45. Battle Sloop, the trademark free version of Battleship. So I run Battle Sloop. Muya runs Battle Sloop. And we want the programs to talk to each other. Okay? It's a two player game, right? It's Battleship, right? So there's a lot of different ways you can do IPC. IPC stands for Enter process communication. There you go. There are the letters. You're welcome. So the, uh, see the mouse jumping around. It's cause I've got my, uh, the, uh, the tablet is over my, uh, wireless charger. Uh, move this. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, uh, can any of you guys think of some ways of having one process communicate with another process. Why buy RAM when you can download it for free? <laughs> so how do you have one process talk to another process? Have you guys ever played any multiplayer game over a network, that's the easy option, right? What else? <clears throat> We're on the same system, right? So you don't, I mean, you could, right? Uh, this thing isn't giving me any more canvas space, is it? Uh -huh. okay. So let's say we've got, um, it's still panning, it's still panning. Great, thank you. Yep. Panning hand down here. You, all right. So here we've got uh, Kearney's Battle Sloop. And over here we've got Muya's, all right. Have them work in the same memory. Reading what the other program writes. Refer to the same area of data, local co-op. Um, yeah, so uh, let's let's go over a few different ideas, right? So first of all, you could do a socket, right? So option one is uh, you could do sockets programming, and that's something I want to go into in this class, actually. If the internet ever comes back up here, I can do more programming assignments. Um, <clears throat> sockets programming, um, and so what you do is you uh, uh, create a socket. And a socket is like a power outlet. So if you guys, that, I mean, that's why they're called sockets. Have you guys ever seen a power outlet in a house? Like a, right? Your good art skills here. All right. And so um, you guys know what I'm talking about? Like a power socket? Hazleton's never seen one. It's okay. So, uh, uh, so like, if you, if you if you think about it, right, uh, the way that sockets work, you got like a you got like a why is this thing just scrolling around? Um, you got like a power station. Oh my gosh, what the hell, dude? All right. What the hell? Stop. One note. Why are you so terrible? <laughs> it's it's not letting me click on anything. Arr. No, a good program one that is such a good program. It's frozen. It's not frozen, but it won't let me click on anything. All right. Who knew that one would be hard to use in Vim? I know, right? Okay. All right. So. 
Lost my ink. That's cool. Thank you. Killing thickness. Okay. So if you are um, familiar with how sockets work, you've got like your your power plant. This is a power plant. Let's draw some smoke coming out, out from it. Maybe a nuclear power plant. Okay. Smoke coming out. Steam. Actually, it's not smoke. Steam tower. There you go. And so if you think about how sockets work, it's like the power company puts energy into the grid and then it somehow gets over to you and it comes out from your socket and goes into your computer, right? You don't actually worry how the electricity gets there. All you know is that when you plug in to the socket, you can receive electricity from it, hopefully. I do have a couple of sockets in my house that have never worked. Um, and so in programming, uh, sockets work the same way. So if Muya wanted, if, if we had the socket set up already and how you do that is a whole lesson, basically if he tosses data into the socket here, I can pull that same data out. So if he sends one, two, three this way, I will get one, two, three out this way. And if I send into here, um, four, five, six, why not? Then he can pull out four, five, six. And it just works like magic, right? Assuming that your gardeners haven't dropped a spade through your internet connection, it works like magic, okay? So uh, you just put data in and then data will magically come out the other side. So sockets is really cool and it works over the interwebs and things like that. And you've got the transmission control protocol slash internet protocol, TCP IP. Um, and you've got, um, there's the multiple layer model and, and all this kind of stuff, the seven layer burrito, whatever. Um, that's a whole class really on, on just getting sockets to work. Now, uh, we don't need to use sockets. Why? Because we are on the same machine. Okay. So if we are going to do local, no, that wasn't too useful, was it? So uh, option number two would be um, pipe. Okay. And so uh, a pipe. Yeah, my program over here. He's got his program over here. There's a syscall that allows you to create a pipe and it works basically like a socket. You can read and write to it. Okay. But uh, let's talk about, because we're talking about memory today, let's talk about memory mapping right and so when you memory map something you can actually take a chunk of ram from another program or from the operating system and pull it into your address space so the mmu which is the watchdog of all this stuff uh, you can request that it maps certain pages of memory like let's say a page is like a kilobyte of memory uh, you can request that that guy, that page right there, over there, is the same as my page over here. And so you can actually create a, a bunch of shared memory. Shared memory. Shmim. Shared memory. And you can actually do this. And everything that you write to one of them We'll get written to the other one. Why? Because it's literally the same chunk of RAM. Okay. Yeah, you got, you got to be careful with it because what if you're reading and writing to the same chunk of RAM at the same time? And that brings up uh, the issue of mutexes. A mutex is a mutual exclusion. And when you have shared memory, you need to lock a page. So like if you're going to be reading and writing to a chunk of memory, well, oftentimes you'll grab a mutex, a mutual exclusion. So I can be the only person to read and write to it. You read and write to it and you release the mutex. And in, in C++, there is a mutex library that does that. Um, and it's very easy to use, very hard to use without risk of crashing. Um, but yeah, and so basically uh, what I could do is I could write to this RAM here, like my my battleship uh, has, uh, I don't know, three hits left on it, and then he will see that my battleship has three hits left on it. And we can actually just read and write to the variables there 
and um, it'll just be shared between the two. And um, the only thing you have to be careful of is um, is making sure you're not reading and writing at the same time. There's mutexes. There's also uh, atomic. Um, the atomic library, which uh, has nothing to do with Fallout. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, what an atomic operation means is you cannot split it, right? As we all know, you cannot split an atom. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Now, an atomic operation is one that when you do it, it, it does it. You, there's no reading, updating, and writing. It takes place in one operation. And so... Uh, da, 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 da. So if you have multiple threads that are sharing uh, memory, um, you can uh, use atomic. You can have atomic bulls, atomic bomb, baby. Don't copyright notice me, YouTube. That wasn't the real song. Atom bomb, baby. Um, so you can create atomic versions of these variables, and they can be read and written to... Um, in one operation. So you don't read, update, and then write. And so that allows you to use shared memory um, a little bit more safely. Uh, in general, though, you're going to be using mutexes, um, lock guard, and things like that. No, yeah, OK, there we go. Uh, so like, let's say you've got two threads that are accessing uh, memory like this. you got a map. And um, <clears throat> These two guys are going to uh, trying to be reading and writing to this shared data structure. Then you, you create what's called a lock guard. And uh, basically, you say lock that mutex. Every mutex has its own name. So you say lock mutex number one. And then if the other, if the other thread is in that mutex right now, it'll wait. And once the other guy releases it, then you go. But if uh, the other guy is not in it, then you acquire the lock. You acquire the lock here, and do you do your thing? You uh, update the you update the data structure, and then when this thing goes out of scope, the destructor on it releases it. So lock guard is a very simple it's a very simple object that basically when when it gets created, it checks to see if the lock is available. If the lock's available, it takes it. If the lock's not available, it waits. And then when it goes out of scope, it releases it, or you can release it uh, manually. If if you're in, if you're in a big block of code, you can release it earlier as well. And so basically, these two guys will be able to read and write to the same data structure by using a mutex. Okay. So anyhow, so yeah, you can you can you can memory map uh, things like that. Uh, in general, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd probably just use sockets, just because then you can run it locally or Internationally, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the the real use for MMAP is with the uh, operating system, actually. So rather than MUIA here, um, and these two things are worth learning, by the way. Mutex and Atomic are both uh, really important things to learn. Uh, so rather than this being MUIA, I'm going to write this as the OS. So what you can actually do is uh, the OS, the way that OSs work, it's actually really interesting. Your, your graphics card, your, your Ethernet card, your sound card, and these things may or not actually be cards or they may be just discrete chunks of your operating system or motherboard. Or, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, what you can actually, the, the way that it, an operating system actually works, the way that you talk to a device is it's just RAM, dude. It's just RAM. So uh, this is why you call eight one one before you dig. Yeah. <sighs> I didn't even know they were there, dude. I didn't even know they were there. I just all of a sudden my internet goes down. Okay, so the uh, um, the operating system has all memory, like I said, from eight. Zero 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 zero, all the way up to f f f f f f f f f, and that's assuming this you're considering this is unsigned. 
it's signed, it's inverted, it's below, it doesn't really matter. So the operating system has a chunk of RAM for like your ethernet card. It's got a chunk of RAM for like your video card. And, um, and the way that you write to it, 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 it actually, any memory map device like that, the way that you actually pro like the way that you actually send things over the ethernet card is the ethernet card is just in RAM somewhere. And when you write to, when you write to memory offset 50 in the ethernet card, the ethernet card will send that out over the, the network. That's, that's all it is. And if you're like, well, where did those magic numbers come from? Well, <laughs> you look it up. Uh, I don't have it on this computer. So you, you check you check the reference guide, right? So the GPU is at these memory accesses, right? The, the uh, timer is at this one. The DAP, wait, no, that's different. Is is at this memory address? And so you just go through the you just go through the reference and um, that's gonna be a zoom blurred, but um, uh, I/O peripherals, SD RAM. Uh, you see the MMU here. Let's see, it's kind of blurry. Uh, yeah, and so this this is getting into like computer engineering stuff. Computer science majors generally don't operate at this low level um if this looks cool and fun for you then uh the computer in the computer engineering you know major which is there's computer science which is up here and then there's computer engineering and there's electrical engineering and so this is this is kind of delving into computer engineering territory but i have had to do this before as a computer science major and so you can see there's memory addresses and so what you do is you call mmap um you call you call the memory mapping system call. You request I would like to have access to the Ethernet card, and if the operating system grants it, then it will map these memory addresses into your address space. Okay. Um, okay. So these are for the uh, GPIO pins, um, and so if you want to turn uh, a pin on a Raspberry Pi on and off, you can do it by memory mapping it. This is something that we would normally do in this class. But we're not because of coronavirus. And so here's a Raspberry Pi. It's one of my spare Raspberry Pis lying around. Um, you can see on the Raspberry Pi, you got the chip in the middle there. Right there, it's a chip. And then uh, you've got your uh, HDMI out. You've got your four USB connectors. You got your ethernet. All of these things are located in memory somewhere. And so uh, if you're like, but I don't know how to, you know, like the audio, the audio out right there. How do I, how do I make it play a sound? What memory address is it at? What you do is you find source code of somebody doing it, <laughs> right? You copy it. Like that's the computer science way. Because somewhere there is documentation that has all of the memory addresses and somewhere there is documentation explaining what all this stuff does. But, um, you know, the easiest way is just to find somebody who's done it already and to copy paste it, right? And so these things here, do you see these like little pins here sticking out on it? Like uh, between my eyes right there. You guys see all those pins? So some of those pins are fixed. Some of the pins are fixed at five volts out. Some of the pins are fixed at zero volts out, but a lot of them you can control and you can turn, 
you can turn the voltage on, you can turn the voltage off on them. And so why is that useful? Well, um, like for example, my daughter's art project. Hey, Ada, can you grab your camel? It's by the bookshelf. Thanks. And so uh, it's uh, by the second bookshelf in the, in the library. It's on the ground. Thank you. So uh, if you want to turn a, a pin on, well, that pin could be attached to an LED. And so you can write a program that will turn an LED on. That's your, that's your basic hello world for physical computing, is writing a program that turns a light on. And um, once you can do that, you can kind of do anything. <laughs> that's what it amounts to. Because once, once you get all this you know, nonsense out of the way, then you can uh, really, you know, instead of turning LED, LED on, you can turn a motor on, right? And you'd normally do that through a relay, um, but it, it doesn't really matter right now. Or if you want a wire to turn into an FM transmitter, you can turn it on and off really quickly and broadcast a, an FM signal or an AM signal, um, FM. Okay, so here is my daughter's art project. My camera lost it, its tail. Yeah, I, I put it on the ground next to it. Okay, so here is a camel. It's, it's kind of going to twist it up right now. Okay, okay so here's a camel. Camel. And you can see it's got a uh, different, it's wired up and it's got different LEDs on it, right? And so um, the LEDs each have a wire coming in, wire coming out. Wire coming in is, of course, at 5 volts. Wire coming out is at 0 volts. Well, it's actually got a resistor on it that drops the voltage into the correct range. But that doesn't really matter right now. And so what happens is we have a program that will um, choose using, you know, this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of stuff. It will turn a pin on, and then the, the LED will light up. And uh, then you can turn it off, and the LED will turn off. And um, uh, you can you can program like once you can turn an LED on and off, you can basically do anything because now you've got a program that can throw switches, you know, like um, turn on the fish tank, you know, uh, turn on the AC in the house. If you ever take the uh, control panel off your AC in the house, it's actually pretty simple. Pull the pull the whole unit off if you want, and you just see there's a couple wires coming out. And so um, you can hook up a, a Raspberry Pi and have the Raspberry Pi have a humidity sensor and a temperature sensor or have them together in what's called a humidator sensor, <laughs> which has both humidity and temperature. Humidator, humidator, looks like that. Normally you guys would get one of these as part of this class, but you don't. It sucks for you, coronavirus. So, uh, yeah, this would, these, you, you just get an anti-reverse cable, hook this up to the Raspberry Pi on those GPIO pins. The GPIO pins will read the current temperature, the current humidity, and your program will sit there and over and over again, read the temperature, read the humidity. And it's like, oh, it's getting too hot or it's, you know, it's getting too humid in here. And then uh, you have some output pins connected to your, where your house formerly had a thermostat, you know, Thing and you just click on the house's AC unit, or if you're really cool and you're uh, you're um, like the one I have here, it's got a dry mode, and so you can turn on dry mode, which will sit there and just uh, take humidity out of the air, without necessarily heating or cooling the house. And so um, when you've got when you've got the ability to do this, then you can uh, where'd it go? then you can basically do anything with physical computers. And it's a cool feeling because computer science people normally don't work with the real world. You know what I mean? Like we work with programs, but having your program actually turn on a fan, right? It's really cool. It's a cool feeling. Um, a couple of years ago, I had students do an art project. So they had to make an interactive art exhibit. And uh, so I had 
this pair of students that weren't very good students, but they really got into it. They built a, a pirate ship that when you approach it, it had a ultrasound sensor on it. An ultrasound sensor sits there and squeaks like a bat. You know, you don't hear it because ultrasound. Uh, and if it gets a reflection of a signal back at it, then it's like, okay, there's something that far away. And it can figure out how far away it is by how long it took the sound wave to travel there and back. And so they had an ultrasound sensor on the side of the pirate ship. And uh, it's very simple to wire up. It's a, a resistor and a, about three three wires. It's pretty easy to hook up. And um, they wrote a program that says when somebody comes within a meter of us, turn on some servo motors. The servo motors open the, the firing ports and play a sound that will... Psh, 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 and they turned on a fan also. And so they had these sails on the pirate ship. And so the sails would start blowing in the wind and the pirate ship would start firing cannons at you. It didn't fire anything. It was just audio, but you know, that's the kind of thing you could do. So with the, uh, with the uh, memory map function, you can map in the GPIO pins. So you can map the GPIO pins into your processes address space and you can just read and write to them. Set this variable to be true. Okay, the pin turns high. Set this variable to be false. The pin turns low. That's it. And if you can do that, you can do anything. You know? um, another very common, uh, let's see if there's any questions about that. Uh, okay. Um, another very common thing you, you can use memory mapping for is a file. So you can actually memory map a file. And so you can say, um, you know, I'm, and, and, and this is actually the fastest way of reading and writing to disk, by the way. I benchmarked a bunch of different approaches towards reading and writing to disk. I talked about this when we were talking about system calls. Because I, uh, I was curious how bad IO streams were. Right, because your different options are like IO streams, um, the format library, FMT, uh, printf, the whole uh, standard IO um, library. And then you've got just like your, you know, operating system right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. And I was like, all right, what's going to be the fastest way of writing numbers to disk? And so I, I benchmarked all of these things. And none of them was the fastest. The fastest was actually using MMAP. And so uh, what you can do is you could say, all right, there's this file on disk over here. This is on the hard drive. I want you to map that whole thing into my address space. And so the file is here in address space and it basically works like an array. Do you guys hear that? It works like an array. You've got a file that's like an array. Like, okay, this is a file that's like, I don't know, one megabyte big. There, it's doing it again. Let's say it's one megabyte big. Then to your program, after you've memory mapped it, you now have a one megabyte array. And if you write to this spot in the array, it writes to that spot on disk. And if you write to this spot, it writes to that spot. Do you guys see that? And so you can read and write to a file as if it was just an array. This is very different from how you guys have been doing IO this whole time, right? Uh, you've been using IO streams. So you read one byte in at a time from a file, you write one byte out at a time to disk, right? And there's a stream that just, and it just processes everything in a line. With MMAP, you can jump forward, you can jump backwards, and you can read and write to different chunks of the file. And this is very useful if you have a giant file, <laughs> right? If you've got a gigabyte file, you don't want to have to go through a byte at a time. Now there is a function called seek that will jump forward in the file. But uh, in general, it's just nice if you, like maybe the monsters are held down here and the the heroes are held up here and the world is held up here. And uh, maybe the very first part of the file is like the offsets at memory address 500 is where the heroes are, you know, that kind of stuff. And so when you open up the file, you read the, the directory and then you can jump to the different sections of the file at will and read and write to it like it's like it's an array. Pretty cool. What do you guys think? I think it's cool. We're going to bias you on this one. Be able to treat a file like an array. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, sector locations, not even like, like from, from your perspective as a C++ programmer, um, it, it's just an array. So it's like you got an integer array. You just read and write to memory address 50, 1000, and the MMAP will, the memory, the MMU will translate between that and the hard drive. 
And so the MMU is going to sit, you know, between these two things here. And every time you read and write to this chunk of RAM, it reads and writes to disk. And this is actually the fastest, the fastest way of accessing the drive that I found. When I when I benchmarked it, it was um, much much faster. Let's see if I can find the code for that. Uh, mm, mm, mm. Test one. <laughs> yeah, okay, actually, this is it. This is it. It's funny. That's hilarious, though. Uh, so we got a million, uh, got a million points, and we're testing how long it takes to write to disk using uh so yeah and then this is using the two string function I'm trying to see if that that approach was faster than test let's see If that's completely unrelated. I don't have very good file names, do I? Foo.cc? <laughs> Name.cc? No. Temp. <laughs> it's also terrible. So terrible. Uh. All right, ls dash lt. All right, so when were these guys made? Test September 29th. Probably the other ones are gone. It's unfortunate. Parallel for loop. Have we talked about this before? So if you if you use the OMP library. Um, you can actually parallelize your code so it'll run on multiple uh, CPUs without having to know anything about parallel processing. So you could go and take a semester's worth of parallel processing or you could hashtag include omp.h and then before a for loop you want to run on multiple CPUs you say that. Done. <laughs> That's it. So, uh, all right, that's uh, G plus plus, C. ignoring, uh, right, I have to compile it with, Okay, so that's the running time. Uh, I should probably turn on the optimizer, huh? And I will turn off address sanitizer, things like that. Let's turn on the optimizer. Like that, run it. So you can see with the optimizer on, uh, it's slower. <laughs> it's slower on these, uh, a little bit faster on the big one. Okay. Not negligible, kind of negligibly different. It's fine. All right. Measurement error. Okay. So let's do this again, this time without OpenMP. Oof. Um, all right. Let's turn the lab off real fast. Run it. And you can see that uh, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so. 
that's the the unfortunate reality of OpenMP, and that's what I found before too. Was that uh, for smaller tasks, it can actually um, like you see that like it's actually there, there's an overhead to creating a different thread and then having to wait for the threads to finish. And so for a lot of uh, very fast tasks, it's actually not worth paralyzing over. But uh, if your program does run for a while, then a really simple thing you do, include the header file, uh, put that in front of a for loop, and uh, yeah, and then include, and then uh, compile with dash f open MP. I'll, I'll put these into, I'll put these into, okay. One, two, three, actually, yeah. Step one, hashtag include omp.h. Step two, and step three, compile it with the dash of f open and p flag and there you go so rather than having to go to the hard work of taking a parallel processing class and things like that the world's easiest way of parallelizing code is that and so you just put a pragma a pragma is a processor dire uh, compiler directive sorry so for example if you ever see a hashtag pragma once in a header file that's a directive to the compiler to include that header file only once so uh you can move your image filter to c plus plus and do gifs sure yeah, you could you could uh, you, you try it. You know, the 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 really nice thing about OpenMP is that while it doesn't work very well in a lot of cases, um, it doesn't cost you very much time to try it. Right? It's one header file to include, one line to you slap on top of a for loop, compile the code, see if it gives you a speed up or not. Now, my system only has my system only has two cores, so. Um, if, if I was on a more modern system and I was doing a bigger task, probably would see more of a gain, right? But, uh, yep, that's, uh, try it out. E that's the world's easiest, uh, parallel processing. You don't have to take a semester of it. Just slap that, slap that into a program. See if it helps. It might, might not. I've, I've seen it help, but you know, for s small programs, a lot of times the overhead of trying to create a thread and join later. It's not worth it. Uh, OpenMP with embedded assembly. Great idea. Great idea. Reed always has the, uh, the best ideas for this class with bridges though. We need to do with the bridges for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. Let's do parallel, parallel processing with assembly. With like, but like not real assembly. Let's do it with, let's do it with the assembly directive. Yeah, that's a great idea. The assem command. Heck yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, and so the M the M map thing. This is actually um, it's supposed to be putting this. It's really important. Put it this way, the like, like I said, the fastest way of reading writing to disk is using MMAP, right? And computer science people care about fast, so this is something you're probably expected to actually know and do. Um, I wish I had my demo code still on there. It's pro the, the the irony is that it's probably somewhere, you know, <laughs> September twenty. So you're gonna have to find all files on my computer that were that date from September 29th. Maybe it's in the code directory. Jeez, look at this September 29th. Oh my gosh. Like I said, I really need to because I, I just pop off quick programs, you know, and uh, non-blocking September mm, original read. On blocking.cc. Let's try that one. All right. Yeah, this is all stuff you might need to know too. So these are these are things called coroutines. Mm, 
promises, futures, things like that. Uh, arg. Such, such terrible names. Arg.cc. And map. Boom. All right. Let's try this one out. There's mmap2 and mmap3. I don't know what the difference is at this point. Uh, all right. Okay, all right. Hmm. Which one's going to be easier to explain? This one's probably a little bit shorter. Okay, so. Uh, uh, standard I.O., whatever. Okay, let's leave it alone. Um, okay, so what's going on here? Uh, so this is C. This is C. So let's let's see what's going on here. So the uh, the user is expected to run this program passing in a command line parameter. Do you guys remember that command line parameters? So if I run it without it, uh, it'll crash because there's no size given, All right? Uh, but if I pass in a command line parameter like 900. Ooh, that didn't work either. All right, interesting. Uh, good file. Oh, I'm supposed to pass in not a size. I'm supposed to pass in a name. Maybe? I don't know. Hey, uh, then, mm, touch, test, test. There we go. The, uh, I, I did not write this code, by the way. Oh, there's also mmap as well. All right, let's go back to mmap2. <clears throat> okay, so you guys know what this means, right? So when you when you run a command like then main.cc, main.cc gets passed in on argv. Okay. So this is how you open a file using a system call, right? Open is a system call. Unix is written in C, Linux is written in C, and its system calls are C functions. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a um, behind the scenes. This is going to invoke software interrupt zero and all that stuff, but it's a C interface. And so it's going to try opening up this file, the file that we pass in in the command line parameter. It's going to open it up in read only mode. And uh, I don't remember what that means. Yeah. Open uh, the mode. Okay. So that is uh, the permissions, right? <clears throat> and uh, mode zero. Set of a special thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the mode, the permissions on it. Um, if the thing did not open properly, then um, open will return a file descriptor of negative one. If it couldn't open the file, like that's what happened the first times. I gave it a file name that didn't exist, so it couldn't open it. Okay, so here is a system call called mmap. That's what I've been talking about. And so what it's going to do, it's going to memory map uh, that file into our address space. And uh, the that is how many bytes to uh, memory map. And we have a little function here called get file size that... Um, should have a space after it. I didn't write this good. I, I, I was playing with different mmap uh, 
functions that I found online because, you know, trying to remember all these different flags is beyond my uh, capabilities because I don't, I don't do it very often. Right? So a uh, stat, by the way, stat is a system call that gets information on a file or folder. Okay. So LS stats a file, right? So if I were to uh, LS uh, test, that calls stat. And um, ls l test. And so stat will return things like permissions, owner, modified time, file size, things like that. And it returns them in a struct. So a stat struct. And uh, man, stat, uh, nope. Neat. Um, man, two stat, uh, right? So some stat, um, there we go. So there's a struct called a stat struct and it returns things like, um, the owner, the group owner, um, how big it is, it's mode, mode is permissions, things like that. Okay. Last time it was accessed, last time it was modified, last time status change, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, um, so stat writes, so you pass in a file name and it writes all of the file information on that file into ST. Does that make sense to you guys? So we, we've talked about a couple different system calls. System calls in this file is open. It's a file. Uh, there is mmap, which maps a file into our RAM. Stat, get info on a file. And then we've got down below write, which obviously it writes. Yeah. Okay. So does this make sense? Like these, these system calls and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about nmap. Okay. So nmap says map in this case, 13 bytes and it, you pass in various flags. And again, these things, uh, I, I Google, right? I don't, I don't have them memorized cause I don't do it very often. Uh, but the important thing here is the file descriptor. And so the file descriptor is remember when we're, when you're talking about files, in Unix, everything's just in it, you know? And so when you open a file, it gives you a file descriptor, just in it, nothing crazy. And so I'm saying map this file, this many bytes from this file, offset zero, maybe, something like that. Maybe that's the offset, I don't know. Uh, you can probably look it up and, and map. Um, address, that will find, that will find a available spot. Um, that's how many bytes to map. Uh, address is null. The kernel chooses the spot. Yeah. So when you pass a null here, the kernel chooses a spot. Memory protection. Uh, pages may be read, read. And remember how we said every every spot in memory can be ha have permissions to read, permissions to write, permissions to execute. <clears throat> so. I think ours is coming in read-only mode. Um, flags shared. So are you going to share? Um, can you share this with another process like I was talking about earlier with Battle Sloop? Uh, flags, uh, private. So uh, remember how we talked about copy on write? So when you do copy on write, um, it'll it'll appear to have a copy of, of, a, of an array but it doesn't actually copy it until you write to it. Then it will trigger a, a fault. The fault handler will actually duplicate the page and then you can write to it. What was it? What was the last one? Offset. Yeah. So you can choose an offset in the file. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so starting at offset zero, um, we're going to open up this file, 13 bytes of it, and it's going to return a pointer. 
So like I said, it just works like a, it just works like a array. So in map just returns a pointer. Here's, you know, it finds a chunk of your, of your address space that wasn't being used. It says, here's, here's your new array. That array holds the entire file and uh, check to make sure it doesn't have an error. And then we are going to print all the data in the array to the screen. And then we unmap it. So you just pass in the pointer and how many bytes long it is and it unmaps it and then we're done. And so you can use, you can use this array here. Uh, it's kind of a char array, I guess. Um, and you can just read and write to it. Uh, I guess you can't write to it without, with that turned off. Right. Um, you can read to it certainly. Um, and so you, you could just treat a file as if it was an array. So I could say like, um, mapped data score bracket zero is equal to C. Uh, let's see if it doesn't like that because it's a void pointer. Void's not assignable. Let's make it a char. <clears throat> doesn't like that. Mapped and mapped data. And I'm going to need to give myself read and write protections. So I will bitwise or that together. All right. Let's see if this works. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you can see that I changed um, the first byte of it to C. Okay. Hmm. It didn't. Uh, it didn't write back there. I'll have to think about why that 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 didn't work. Um, ooh, test format. Yeah. Good yeah. So uh, I need to I need to look at that too. Uh, mmap uh, three dot c. And so okay. So here uh, we're in mapping a file again. And so what we did up here, this code up here is going to create a file, a giant file. And so it opens the input file. It opens the output file. It's going to copy, I guess, from one file to the other. Is that what's happening? OK. And so it uh, gets, it calls stat, fstat, which is not the system call. It's the C library version. fstat is. It stats the file, sees how big it is. And then for the file we're going to create, it calls seek. So it jumps that many bytes to the right in the file prints a, a byte to it that create that makes that look like if the if the like let's say you're copying a megabyte from one file to another if you want to make a megabyte long file what you can do is you can seek a megabyte in the distance and write a byte there and the operating system will actually create a megabyte long file that actually doesn't eat up a megabyte because it's got a hole in it it's kind of cool and then we are uh in mapping the input file so again that's going to um this is going to uh, return a pointer. So source is basically like a pointer to the input file. This is a pointer to the output file. And then we're calling mem copy, and that will copy bytes from the uh, starting file to the ending file, and it will copy X number of bytes over. And so this is a very fast way of copying a file yep. by using mmap. So does this make sense to you guys? Like source is just a char star it's just a character array dust is a character array <clears throat> and we're and by using mmap you can treat a file as if it was a character array and you can just read and write to it okay is that what dd does uh yeah when you when you uh when you create a large file that doesn't like it, let, let's say you jump 10 gigabytes to the right using seek and you write a byte there, the operating system's like, I'm not making 10 gigabytes of zeros. It creates a hole. It, and, and so if things are close by, it doesn't make a hole. But if you seek far enough to the right, then the operating system will actually not, you can actually have a file that looks like it's 10 gigs. It doesn't take up 10 gigs. Um, so...
see if I can demonstrate this to you. So I'm just going to strip out all the in-app stuff and just show you guys how holes work. So this is going to open up, uh, let's just make it argv1, uh, okay, and uh, args, uh, and so rather than having a size here, I'm just going to put in a big number. Like, uh, oh, this is C again. 10 megabytes, let's do 100 megabytes. I should probably close it afterwards. Close JavaScript drive. So, uh, blob. So if we vim blob, see it's this, like vim is choking right now. Vim is reading this giant, do you see how big that file is? That's a big old file. Look at that. That's a big file. Err, quit vim. Err, quit die. Err, err, err. Okay. So, Blob is, let's do that in human readable form, 96 megabytes, okay? If we stat blob, you'll see despite it having a giant ass size, it's only eating up eight blocks of hard drive space. Okay. So the, um, the thing uh, doesn't actually eat up like as much room as it thinks it is. Kind of cool. No, oh, no, 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 no. Cute. Okay. Then, uh, what do I call it? Hole. That's it. Okay. So that is that. So let's talk about the midterm. Uh, I think that's pretty good for now. Uh, memory mapping, yeah. So you, you can memory map devices in, so you can read and write to Ethernet, read and write to the GPI opens, read and write to your graphics card. Um, you can memory map in files so that you can read and write to them quickly. You can memory map in shared memory from other programs. It is a really, really powerful and really, really useful tool. The, the earlier stuff I was talking about with virtual memory, um, yeah, you could go your whole life without really knowing about it because... Um, it's just invisible to a programmer. This, however, is why you actually need to know this stuff because if you don't understand how the MMU works, like you can't really understand how MMAP works. But MMAP will allow you to have the MMU map things into your address space. And, um, and, and then there's a lot of really cool things you can do, like turning on lights on a camel or reading and writing to a file quickly. Contacting the server for information. That's right. Okay. So, um, eh, great. Thank you. Super awesome PowerPoint. Never change. All right. So let's talk about the midterm. Um, so the midterm, uh, I don't know if there's going to be a programming section on it. There, because I, I can't, I can't promise that the uh, internet's going to be back up. Um, if if there is, there will be a programming session on it. Uh, but basically, what topics have we talked about in this class? So, 
uh, topics include all topics. Okay. And then maybe programming. There we go. Arms documentation. Sweet. So you can see that they've got documentation where, where in RAM each of these different things are. USB is here and keyboard and mouse is here and stuff like that. And so when, if you, if you really get into like that, that low level thing, and, and a lot of you probably will, because, um, there's good money in embedded systems for me. A lot more people do JavaScript than can do this kind of stuff. Right. And so here you go. Here's the midterm, uh, midterm. Here you go. So we're going to cover all the topics we've talked about in lecture and there may be program. Very helpful, huh? <laughs> really sums it up. I know, I know. All right, I know. you're welcome. Uh, all right, so let's let's break it down a little bit. Um, so, of course, the main thing is, of course, ARM programming, ARM thirty two, um, Neon. So some programming questions, and of course, it might be some bitwise stuff. Um, X, octal, decimal, kind of conversion stuff. Uh, two's complement, probably, maybe. Um, IEEE, floats, uh, all the stuff on the worksheets. So like, uh, caching, pipelining, Super scalar. What else we talked about? Register naming, I guess. Pipelining stalls are big. You know, what caused stalls in the pipeline? A big thing. Could go over superscalar real quick, sure. Um, so let's say that you've got add R0, R1, R2. I really need the Wacom drivers and so on this. Uh, and you've got add R3, R4, R5. So Ribera, is there any dependency between these two instructions? You have a 24 hour window in the midterm of two hours to do it. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, there's no dependencies here, right? And so what you have uh, on a non-superscalar system is you've got one ALU, right? So you've got one ALU. And so basically on an on a old school system, uh, this would come in, this thing would chunk around for a while, then it would come out. Then after that was done, this guy would go in. And then after a while, that one would come out. Um, on a superscalar system, what it means is you have, you have, on a super, really, oh my gosh, this thing is so weird. On a superscalar system, you have two ALUs. Okay. And so if you have, like, let's say you have a dual issue system, a dual issue system can issue two instructions at the same time. So in one cycle, this guy's going to go into one ALU. This guy's going to go into another ALU. And then on the next cycle, they pop out. That makes sense. So it's called uh, instruction level parallelism, ILP. Okay. 
industrial light and magic no. In industrial no. instruction level parallelism okay so instruction level parallelism means your computer finds that two instructions can be run in parallel at the same time and if it's got enough execution units available it will uh, deploy both of them at the same time at the same cycle and so if you do this then your uh, instructions per cycle or your cycles per instruction you know depending on which way you look at it uh, your IPC will go up the number of instructions per cycle goes up because now you can do two instructions per cycle instead of one and so you know if you got a one gigahertz system Without superscalar, at best, you could do a billion ads a second, right? So if you have a billion cycles, you could do a billion ads. But with a dual issue system, if you've got two ALUs and your system can push out two ads at the same time that don't depend on, on each other, now a one gigahertz system could do two billion ads a second. It's twice as performant in theory, right? And so... a because Moore's law is dead, kind of, mostly, uh, we, we're not getting faster and faster computers. So instead, we've been focused on getting our IPC up, right? the number of instructions per cycle we can do, right? So if you can, if you take your instructions from cycle from one to two, your computer is now twice as fast, despite not having a higher clock rate. Does that make sense? Now in the class, you want to see my laptop setup? It's it's nothing. Uh, all right, this might get a little meta. Here, let's try this. This, this is my new, uh, my new laptop. Five, and video. Can you give it a practice midterm? Yeah, there will be a practice midterm for sure. Mm -hmm. So let's see if that posts. Not coming up. There we go. So you can see a picture of yourself in Discord while talking on Discord, while streaming Discord. It's very meta. So you see I got my coffee there. Got my Genki textbook for Japanese there. Here we'll even zoom in on it so you can see the laptop on my laptop. <laughs> Some pencils, basic economics by Thomas Sowell. A wrapper I should probably throw away. Yeah. Lack of RGB. What do you mean? There, there's RGB. RGB? Come on. It's very soothing. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a cheap thousand dollar laptop. Like um, it's not I, I don't I don't really invest huge amounts of money in laptops because um, it's like if I'm going to put money into something, I'm, I'm going to put it into my desktop, you know, what I mean, what, which I use most of the time. So, um, yeah, it, it is cheap considering it's got a 30 series NVIDIA card in it. So it's got a, uh, it's got a 3060 in it, which is impossible to find, you know, in retail stores, which is one of the reasons why I got it. I wanted to try it out, see how, see how it worked. Um, but like compared to every other laptop with a 30 series video card in it, it is very cheap. Like you're, you're talking 2k, 3k, 4k for the higher end models. So, um, yep. So it's a little 15 inch monitor. 240 hertz, uh, 50 inch monitor, 240 hertz though on the monitor. So that's pretty nice. Um, 1080p, it's not 4K. It's not really exactly ideal, but <clears throat> it was cheap and it had a 30 series card in it. So Core i5 CPU, not an i7, but like I said, this is, this is just my uh, backup machine. So, so it's fine. It's fine. I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't really, I don't really spend money on uh, laptops okay so let's go take a look at a sample midterm real fast before we finish for the day let's go 
Okay, yes. Basically everything that there's been a worksheet on, I've practiced those. Still good advice. <laughs> Still good advice. No passwords. Allow multiple attempts. Why not? Okay. All right. So let's look at last last year's midterm two. Uh, all right. So converting between binary, decimal, hex, etc. Like that. Uh, adding a hex and a binary number together. So that's hex 11, which is 17. That's binary 11, which is 3. Right. Hex uh, bitwise oring, rotation, bitwise anding, more conversion, more math, two's complement. OK, uh, which one of these things can base arm 32 not do? Uh, division, right? Neon can do it, but. It's not part of the core ARM32. Uh, explain whether these different commands do in assembly. Uh, explain what these neon commands do in plain English. Um, <laughs> what is pipelining, superscalar, out of order? What, what are they all designed to do? They're designed to increase the number of instructions per cycle, right? That's IPC, right? Because their clock rate has kind of stalled. Clock, clock speeds aren't much faster now than they used to be. So um, instead, we've been focusing on IPC, instructions per cycle. Coding section, cool. Uh, this is a, a Parsons problem. So that means given different chunks of code, you have to put them in order. Okay. So that's a clever way of doing a coding section without having to write code. Uh, if you want a label to be added to an, uh, a symbol table, you have to add global to it uh, so that other people can call it. Yeah. Mm, we didn't talk about IPv6, so don't worry about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, five pointer. So, what? Uh, debugging code. Okay. It's debugging code. Uh, decimal, decimal binary, and then direct map. So a uh, uh, cache, caching problem. Um, again, caching, caching, pipeline. Uh, stalls, dependencies of instructions. How can you move it around to improve the performance? According to the middle school computer poster, where is the data stored? Any of you guys remember that? Very good, Vakalar. The CPU. The CPU is where the data is stored. <laughs> That was from day one or day two. There's a middle school poster. The CPU is where the data is stored. Points at the case or something. Okay, so basically I've put up three practice midterms. Um, by the way, I can see when you guys do the practice midterms and it's always depressing when students don't do it, you know, or like they'll like kind of click on it and like look at it and not try to solve it. Um, so at least do one of them. Is it? Uh, shuffle answers, time limit, allow multiple. Okay. I guess I can turn the time limit off on the other one too. Yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, at least do one of them. At least do one of them. It's if you want to be a diligent student that gets an A in this class, at least do one of them. Like, come on, like I'm making all this stuff available to you guys. Take advantage of it, you know. So I, I can pull up the grades right now and show you guys who did the practice practice midterms for midterm one, right? And about three quarters, of you guys did one of them, and like a couple students did uh, two or more. You know, no time on it. Okay. So at least do one. You know, be, a, be a diligent student. All right. So yeah, that's that's basically that's the midterm. Uh, it'll be a twenty-four hour window uh, to start. It'll start uh, after class on Thursday, and so as of two p.m. on Thursday, you can start the midterm. And once you start it, you will have two hours to finish it. Um. Stay tuned for if there will be programming on the server or not, as uh, the server is currently behind a, a severed internet connection outside. So um, midterms, yeah, starting starting on Thursday at 2. And you'll have until Friday at 2 to finish it. And don't start at Friday at 1, because it will shut you off at 2. Um, so, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nico, Nico, my buddy, tried uh, starting one minute or ten minutes before the the cutoff date, thinking that he could squeeze an extra two hours out of it. And... <laughs> okay, so um, yeah. yeah, it's all stuff you guys should know, but get practice at it. Like it, it's it's a little weird not being in person because when we're in person, like I pull students up on the whiteboard and you solve bit problems and stuff like that. And you can't really do it too well online. So just use those sample midterms to use the sample midterms to get practice at it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Any questions about memory mapping? What do you, what do you guys think about it? We would have worked with piss. Oh, pies, pies. I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. It's like, I don't, I don't know what you think uh, <laughs> the classes are all like. <laughs> this isn't R. Kelly College. <sighs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we normally would have worked with pies, and there would be questions on the midterms about pies. Right. So if. Uh, uh, if you see on the previous midterms questions about the Raspberry Pi is about wiring stuff and turning LEDs on, just ignore them. Uh, we obviously can't do the physical computing this semester. Yep. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a uh, but you guys are getting more practice programming, so you know you win some, you lose some. Um, when whenever the internet comes back up, I will notify you guys, and then I'll give you guys a couple extra days to do the homework assignment. At that point, so don't 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 stress out too much for that. Okay, thanks you guys. Have fun and uh, study hard. Do the, do the practice midterms. That's that's my advice. Do at least one, probably two. Okay, all right. See you guys.